and on behalf of the East Ham Historical Society, I wanna welcome you to this free Zoom presentation featuring local artist, Karen Ronaldo and writer lecturer of historical places, Kevin Doyle. Karen is best known for her historical, historically accurate painting, The First Thanksgiving, 1621. That painting is featured in textbooks and this year is on view at the Museums in the Green and Falmouth, our host for this evening. More recently, Karen created a painting that was turned into a poster for East Ham's 400 commemoration programs. This year, our society featured virtual film presentations depicting the coming of the Mayflower, beginning our series with a local archeologist, Dan Zoto, highlighting our vast collection of Native American artifacts that are currently on display in our first people's exhibit at our 1869 Schoolhouse Museum. And continuing through a series featuring early settlers in East Ham. So we felt it only fitting to ask Karen and Kevin to speak on their book in the wake of the May Mayflowers, The First Encounter. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce Karen Ronaldo and Kevin Doyle. I look forward to hearing about their discoveries while they were writing this book. And don't forget, tomorrow, Karen will be in person at the 1869 Schoolhouse Museum at 25 Schoolhouse Road in East Ham for a book signing. And you're all encouraged to come out and get your signed autograph copy tomorrow, 12 noon. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, it's a pleasure. Kevin and I are thrilled to be a part of your summer series and uh, we're looking forward to uh, making this presentation to everyone tonight. And we wanna thank the viewers for tuning in and um, hopefully we have some information that you'll find uh, very interesting. Mark Schmidt here at the Falmouth Historical Society. We uh, thank you for your cooperation, your assistance, your great vision, and for allowing us to be here at the Wicks House where we're broadcasting um, and you can see the painting, part of the painting behind us. Uh, the Wicks House will be uh, holding this painting for our exhibit through December. And uh, we're not sure where it will go after that, but hopefully it will remain uh, on the East Coast in Massachusetts. So uh, we're going to be talking about the inspiration behind the book. Um, the history of the painting and its commissioning that took place in 1994 through an organization called the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches. I'll refer to them a few times going forward as the NACCC. Something I wanted to remark, and, and Kevin and I have talked a lot about uh, the painting, its life, uh, how it took on a life of its own from, from moment one when it was released from my hands. The thing that I, I want to share this with Kevin as well, because I don't think I've really mentioned this part of it. Every day from the moment the piece was created and, and left my hands, I have thought about the painting and the great responsibility that the NACCC put in my hands the trust factor that they had, um, and in telling uh, the story in a visual way, in a sensitive way, which is a word that the Wampanoags have uh, mentioned, that they've been so appreciative of this. But uh, yes, it was an incredible responsibility. Uh, it had to be historically accurate. It was historically accurate. You know, that's what the historians have, have said. And they signed off on a drawing that was created and then transferred to a canvas so that then it could go through the creation of the, the painting process. This was a, uh, a temporary housing. Mark had this vision that for the 400th commemoration of the landing of Mayflower, 
We would have the painting here on the grounds, the uh, campus of the MOG Museums on the Green. This was a temporary housing for it uh, in the Conan Museum. And at the left, you can see that drawing that was, was framed in, in, uh, next to the original piece, which measures three by five feet. So when the painting was completed, it was unveiled at Pilgrim Hall. And this is a banner that they displayed outside of Pilgrim Hall. And, it, you know, and before I flip the, the screen, I told Karen that should become her bed spread. Well, it was a very surreal feeling. Um, and, you know, creating this, this, having this responsibility, creating this painting, I, I took on a, a real sense of uh, getting to know this population, population at the time of 143 uh, in, to, in total. So we're gonna go to the next slide. It takes on a life of its own from the moment that it is released from my hands. And I can't emphasize that enough because it's an unusual situation. The book now has taken on a life of its own. But Scholastic Book early on came to me and asked permission if they could include it in their Teaching American History with Art Masterpieces, uh, which incorporated four other historic paintings, Trail of Tears, uh, The Civil War, Paul Revere's Ride, and The Crossing of Delaware. So I was, I was uh, humbled and uh, very, very happy that, that they wanted to use this piece uh, as an interactive educational component to uh, the magazine. And this is one of the pages within, just talks about the artist and they then have a discussion questions for their classes. That uh, was also recognized by the National Museum of the American Indian and their comment, most historically accurate um, in terms of population and just the uh, composition it, itself. That was a, a nice endorsement to get from them. And this was an article that was incorporated uh, in, that in that article. It was back in the uh, early, perhaps the early 80s when that came out. So the Plymouth Plantation exhibit on Thanksgiving featured this painting, uh, the first Thanksgiving commissioned 1994 to give an accurate, accurate picture of the native presence. And at uh, Pilgrim Hall, they had some well-known paintings by N.C. Wyeth, um, Norman Rockwell. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the images that you've seen over the years, um, Jenny Brownstone's First Thanksgiving. And it was interesting because some of the images still carried that myth and the first Thanksgiving that was represented uh, owned by the NACCC was um, something of the historical accuracy. Most recently, um, for the 400th commemoration, Linda Combs, a uh, Wampanoag from Aquina and a gentleman from England collaborated on the Massachusetts Chronicles. And this incorporates the history of 400 years from the earliest times to the present day and within the book, they incorporated the first Thanksgiving done in a very interesting way. It's as if there's a reporter on the site, on the scene, and, and talking about the event unfolding. Um, it was very nice to get that inclusion from them. And uh, Linda's comment was they picked the right image. Uh, we're going to talk now about a few of the significant dates. And uh, I'm going to give Kevin the floor on this one. At, uh, at, at over the last year or so, Karen has said to me re repeatedly, you know, there's a, there's a book in here, there's a book in here. And of course, what Karen has done is make a visual history. And it really created a, uh, a narrative as well. So we collaborated the whole way through on, the, on exactly how the book would take shape. And we decided there was critical phases that we really had to address. The first one being the period before we, before the uh, Mayflower arrived, and we picked it up with Gosnold in 1602 uh, through 1619, when notionally the uh, Wampanoag uh, presence on Cape Cod would have been the Gnostic sub-tribe. 
then starting in 1609, which overlaps the first period uh, from the time the pilgrims leave from England, go to Amsterdam for a couple of years, they go down to uh, Leiden for 10 more years until they arrive in uh, the New World. We'll talk about that voyage. And we stay with it for the next 50 years, basically, of relative peace, uh, a peace that uh, Chief Flying Eagle of the Wampanoag tribe had uh, commended us in the preface to our book, saying, finally, someone is looking at this period with a positive eye because there was 50 years of relative peace. Uh, and uh, then of course, King Philip's War uh, in 1675, 1676. And then right up to the present, we take the, the final phase, which is the third part of the book, which is uh, the, the origins of the 15 Cape Cod towns, which Karen had documented during the bicentennial. One of the issues that comes up, and I think we're all very sensitive to this, uh, I'm not a Mayflower descendant, but my wife is, and we'll point, out, point her out when we, when we get to that point. But if you look down the bottom right-hand side, we're gonna talk about Geoffrey Chaucer and his prologue to the Canterbury Tales, written 200 years before the Pilgrims left. And he, remember, he is an Englishman, obviously. And one that after all the shoot is so to the truck to march has pierced to the road. What he's talking about is, is April, with April showers every year, done long and folk to go on on pilgrimages. Here's the word right there. If there's any doubt in anybody's mind, Jeffrey Chaucer for 200 years prior to the, to the, uh, uh, to the pilgrims was talking about people uh, going on pilgrimages. And where would they go? Well, especially from every Shearer's end of England to Canterbury, they went. And so they're going to the Archbishop of Canterbury. This kind of plays into the fact of the, uh, of, of the issue of uh, buying indulgences. That's why they would go and visit the Archbishop of Canterbury to, to pay homage. So then we have the harbor scene. And I think it's, it's critical. I think a lot of us on the uh, here tonight recognize this, but a lot of people who go to Plymouth Plantation don't quite get it. You know, as we look at Amsterdam in the year 1600, look at what's there. You find all kinds of ships of the size of the Mayflower. You find ships the size of uh, boats, the size of the uh, shallop uh, in the foreground. But more importantly, you find brick buildings and, and towering steeples. Uh, people think that the, the, the pilgrims were bringing over what they knew from England uh, to be with them there, uh, here in America. And they left behind an awful lot. Now, this could be a scary slide. You know, I, I like to say to understand the pilgrims, you really have to understand the Holy Roman Empire. So how does that happen? Uh, right after when the Roman Empire fell and there were no more emperors in Rome, uh, from Rome, the government really fell to the, uh, to the Pope and to his archbishops. And it became the Holy Roman Empire that stretched basically from England over to Turkey. Uh, and after about a thousand years of that, 800, a thousand years, people realized that, you know, this is not the separation of church and state that it probably should be. We're buying indulgences. And that was the primary thing that Martin Luther was uh, very, very rebellious against. Uh, he protested against it in Wittenberg in 1517. And he was the first one to start the Protestant Reformation, uh, saying, you know, uh, Martin Luther pointed out 95 things wrong with the church. He said, we've got to, including buying indulgences. So the, the people start breaking away in the Reformation. King Henry VIII, about 20 years later, turns to the Pope and says, hey, 
I've been married to Catherine Varagon for 20 years. I don't have any children. I don't have any heir. I need a new wife. And the, and the Pope said, no, you, you can't do that. And so Henry VIII said, well, the heck with that, then I'll start my own religion and I'll be the head of that and I can do whatever I darn well please. So that goes on. And after, so that's in 1539 or thereabouts. So after about 60 or 70 years, a puritanical sect, the, the Puritans spring up in England and they look at the Church of England and they say, gosh, you know, we're looking at, at things wrong with this church too. Uh, and, and the big thing was if it's not Now Puritans become two types of people. They become people who want to change the religion from inside the, uh, the Church of England. And then there are other Puritans who said, no, this is unsalvageable. You can't do it from inside. You have to do it from outside. And they get the name separatists. And, and again, I think there's a misunderstanding among a lot of people when they talk about separatists they treat it, they teach it like it's a bad thing. They talk about it like it's a bad thing. Oh, the pilgrims are a bunch of separatists. And there's all kinds of separatists in England. They, they both basically were Puritans. Yeah, and they, then they understood the differences. I think that's what then separated their philosophy. Right. And even Bradford in talking about uh, pilgrims, this is on, uh, he writes this in 1630, you know, within 10 years later on. So they left the goodly and pleasant city, which was from Amsterdam and from uh, Leiden, which had been their resting place for nearly 12 years. But they knew they were pilgrims and they looked not so much upon the things they left behind, but they lifted their eyes up to heaven, the dearest country and, quiet, and this quieted their spirits. So that's what they're doing. They're, they're going on a pilgrimage uh, to purify the religion in the new world. Now, I'm going to make a comment about, about just this image that I think uh, as much as it's one of great hope and expectation that they're now in search of, I think this is really um, highlighting the desperateness of this situation. And this is the, uh, the image, it's in the book, uh, of the departure from Holland through England on the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And of course, we all know the story, 66 days at sea. And in the last three days, a storm came up, knocked them off course and blew them way to the north. So instead of hitting the mouth of the Hudson River like they intended to, they landed right there at the National Seashore, uh, basically. And they knew where they were. They knew where they were because Gosnell told them. Gosnell was a, a, uh, an explorer. He wasn't a settler, but he was an explorer. So he had already mapped out the area. He named it Cape Cod, as you know. He named uh, Martha's Vineyard after his sister. He named the Elizabeth Islands after the queen. And he named, so as they transited down, uh, Captain uh, Jones, Christopher Jones realized that they were off course. So he started to sail southward and he was going to turn the corner at Chatham and go over to Hudson River. Uh, but as we all know, you turn the corner at Chatham, you run into the Montemoy Islands and you'll go into a lot of shoal territory. It's now the middle of November, it's very cold. It's been miserable, it's been two months at sea. He says, I'm not gonna try that today. Let's go back up and find shelter in, in Provincetown. So they do. Yeah, and in advance of the next slide, uh, just to make this other comment too, that they're handed off a note by their Reverend Robinson, mm -hmm. who they've left behind. And, and I think that was a, a tragic point that they had to leave him behind, or it was his decision to stay behind. Uh, but I think in the journey is when the Mayflower Compact is actually being composed, because when they arrive, in, in Provincetown, they pretty much have this well under well underway. Yeah. 
And, and again, you've seen these plaques around in different places. 1602 Bartholomew Gosnell uh, was, was all over here. We don't dispute that there are other people in, uh, in, in America before, before the pilgrims. Of course there were. Uh, and uh, St. Augustine was in place. Uh, they had the lost colony of, uh, uh, in North Carolina in Albemarle. Nothing was left but the word Croatan. They came down to Jamestown. We know that's 1607. Uh, but they were on their way to leaving. They, they had all but starved themselves out. They were gone. There was no cooperation from the local tribe there whatsoever. Powhatan had no use for any of them. Uh, and that just about ended down in, in uh, Jamestown. But the difference was here. So here the, uh, here's the, the Mayflower II uh, sailing through the, well, here's the latest reincarnation, sailing through the canal. That was fun. Yeah, it was great. Just the flotilla and the inspirational crowds that turned out. We were there from the very early in the morning, but the crowds started building and you could just feel the excitement. It was a wonderful time. It could. And so they landed. So I'll, I'll pick it up from here. We show the uh, plaque, the first landing place of the pilgrims. Yeah, we're trying to get an advance here of the slide. And uh, this is at the other end of Commercial Street in Provincetown. It's the approximate location of where the Mayflower would have landed. Again, this is the breakwater. And we show the Pilgrim Monument here. And the Mayflower Compact, an amazing document, covenant, uh, written uh, for and by the people. A civil body politic is how it's explained. This is in six lines in the content in the Mayflower Compact. They're, they're unveiling the first form of self-governing. And, you know, from, from the standpoint of they're 3,000 miles from home, uh, they're still in an allegiance or an alliance of respect of a sort to the king. I find that incredible because he has had, had them in exile. They were leaving the country because of the conditions that he created, and yet, they still have this demeanor to their, their feelings. And I'm, and I'm wondering, how does one adopt that, that mentality? How, how do you do that? I mean, they were miserable in that country, which is why they came here. You want to add anything all, to that? All very you? true. Now I'm just going to go to the next, yeah. next slide to talk about what, what, uh, what Karen had just talked about. These are the, the, the wordage of the... Uh, of the compact, as you know, there's no surviving document, but it's, re it's referenced in two contemporary, contemporaneous uh, writings. This is Mort's relation. Uh, and the Mayflower Compact says, we undertook this to the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith. And it's a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, which was actually even north of the northern part. Uh, and they do solemnly and mutually combine ourselves together into that. And that's where the, the, the language is, the civil body politic. Why? For the better ordering and the preservation of, of ourselves and to enact such just and equal laws as shall be for the general good of the colony. This is unbelievable. For a thousand years, they had done what the king told them. They had done what the archbishops told them. And now they are saying, we're going to enact our laws that will be for the general good. And the last line, and we do promise all submission and obedience yeah, to whatever and, we talk and about. And I think that Reverend Robinson has his fingerprints on this, this document. Um, it's clear in the language, it's a do good type of uh, uh, philosophy. Yeah, very much so. And, and so, Again, there's, there's those debates. Was it really the, the forerunner of the Constitution? Yeah, we think it was. You know, there's, there's history and then there's interpretations of what, what you want to do with it. 
the documents are there. Mort's relation is basically ground zero. And what you do with it then is your interpretation. But we look at it and say, hey, right now in that document, you find majority rule. You find a democratic governance. They, they knew they were independent. They had to be independent. So they had to be self-sufficient because they were outside the king's realm totally. They knew among themselves, they didn't want a monarchy anymore, but they weren't going to tolerate anarchy either. Uh, and, and we kind of think that's the foundation of the American spirit. It's, it's a document that we all relish, as you've seen it, uh, I'm sure, in the Fourth Fathers Monument uh, in, in Plymouth. And we see it in the, in the relief tablet at the base of the Pilgrim Monument. Uh, different depictions, there's women and some, there's children and so forth. You can, again, figure probably not going to be, probably not really there. The 41 signers were all, uh, all males speaking on behalf of the family. But one of the things to look at is they were males of every station in life. You had Miles Standish in the military, you had senior religious uh, 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 members, you had senior civic members, uh, and then you had uh, a guy like John uh, Howland uh, or John Alden, uh, who, who were, I would say nobody who didn't have any standing in the caste system of England at the time, they signed equally. And again, it's, uh, it's a document that really levels the, the classes of America and, and creates, again, this American spirit. And so the question is too, has that then inspired future documents? And uh, we feel that, that it has. We rely heavily on what's relation. Um, and the reason we do is that it, it seems to uh, echo an immediacy to the times. And they didn't have a lot of time to be um, writing journals and writing notes. They were in uh, everyday survival mode. Um, and so we, uh, we've actually uh, referenced what's relation several times. And uh, this now shows the different landing points from Provincetown, Mayflower's Landing, Corn Hill, the significance of their taking the corn. Also, uh, we, we reference uh, Pilgrim Spring and the line, the dotted line going down to First Encounter and in East Charlotte. Ham with the shallop, and then over to Plymouth where they then start their colony. And so the first spring, um, they are, you know, they're in a desperate situation now. They have about 16 of their men um, traveling through some uh, tough terrain. They come upon um, a fresh spring of what is their first drink of uh, fresh water. And um, we have a slide that's showing the path leading, leading to the spring. There's also a, a monument there, and again, an approximate location. They continue uh, their journey on along to an area that was then called Pilgrim Pond, and, and 16 of the pilgrims camp here on their way to Corn Hill in Truro. We should point out, a lot of people don't know that it's there. I'll tell you who doesn't know, yeah. Edith Bridges. We had a wonderful tour from Edith and uh, her husband, Warren, um, so we were thrilled to be able to add this into our presentation. So Ida, thank you very much for that information. And, uh, and this lists the uh, 16 pilgrims as they're making way with their expedition. And this is, this is a view of the pond showing it. not much changed in the, uh, in the landscape there, thick brush and uh, vacant landscape. Corn Hill is in the distance, it's very typical. Um, and then Corn Hill, you can see at the furthest end. And at the base of the hill to the left of the flagpole, there are two, two uh, plaques. And uh, one is referencing the Corn Hill that they, um, that they do. Uh, they find corn. This is a pivotal moment, I think, for the pilgrims. Um, 
it's showing not only their vulnerability, but the humanness. They, um, they're in a desperate state of mind. And they say, we digged up a great kettle full of very fair corn. If we could find any of the people, we would give them the kettle again and satisfy them for their corn. And we call this place Corn Hill. And they're always uh, thankful to God. And they say, and sure, it was God's good providence that we found this corn for else we not know what would have happened. Basically, they are still um, getting over this uh, journey that they were on. So as soon as we can meet conveniently with them, we will give them full satisfaction, which they do. Yeah, those are very critical words because, you know, you, you hate to pick a fight with Nathaniel Filbert, but we do, uh, because he talks about stealing the corn. And I think that's a very unfair judgment to the pilgrims who have already uh, written such a document as the Mayflower Compact. They say twice in, in this, we'll satisfy them if we ever see them and, and we'll give them full satisfaction even to their kettle. Those are critical words. Uh, and as Karen just said, and they do, and they do it with, when uh, Chief Aspinet returns the Billington boy uh, to, to the uh, encampment there in, uh, in Plymouth. And Bradford goes immediately and, and, and Bard is with him uh, for the corn. So it wasn't stolen in any, in any way. Well, you know, this is the interesting thing about anniversaries. It gives people an opportunity to reflect back and going forward to, try, you know, for visual historians and for writers, for authors, it's very annoying to find inaccuracies in our in our history. And so the visual historian tries to get it right. The author tries to get it right. And um, this, uh, I don't know how many times you know, in a century people will rewrite uh, history, but it's a constant, it's um, an always learning experience as well. But an anniversary is a prime time for getting it right, I think. Excellent. And, um, and so here we have uh, the plaque again, um, talking about the, uh, the expedition, the 16 pilgrims going up to Corn Hill. Uh, and this was uh, just kind of in the middle of all this brush. Again, uh, Edith uh, was able to help us find this little monument. Edith up, was up there with the lawnmower. Yeah, yeah. And this little cottage city at the top of the hill. And this is at the uh, midpoint of that hill where we found this monument. And this point starts what became all the inspiration behind work that I did for uh, East Ham and uh, this, their uh, celebration. Um, it's a marsh, the view across the marsh, and you can see first encounter section uh, to that high hilly area. Yeah, if, if I could talk about the battle itself. Mm -hmm. uh, as you look at that, we envision the encampment, as, uh, the encampment, the overnight uh, uh, Harbor, the, the old overnight encampment of the pilgrims uh, in the Charlotte. It was the very first trip in the Charlotte. We kind of picture there right where that house is at the end. Uh, and if you look at the uh, montage that Karen prepared for East Ham, you'll see smoke rising from the right hand side. We kind of figured that was down around Windmill Square. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to talk mm -hmm. from that so people can see it. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you'll see many depictions of different ways. I think it makes sense uh, that they were on the high ground. They chose to, make, to choose the high ground. Now, let's talk about uh, native warfare. It was well known that, and I'll say Indians, whether the indigenous or the native people with the Wampanoags, attack at just before first light. It's very disorienting to be waking up with these shrieks as, as was typical of their warfare and the announcement, the, the commencement of battle. Shrieks in the middle of what you think is the middle of the night. It's actually just before dawn. Now, the, the, well, the number is uncertain. 25, 30 uh, Wampanoags are descending on the, uh, on the encampment. Now, these guys could shoot a rabbit with a bow and arrow. That's how they, that's how they got their game. So these guys are excellent, excellent with the bow and arrow. 
an Englishman had a blunderbuss. All you had to do was shoot the thing and you're going to hit somebody. But I would say miraculously, mm -hmm. after a 15 minute skirmish, nobody was, nobody was wounded, no one was killed. And the language that they chose to use in Mort's relation was, as we left this place, we called it the first encounter, a very neutral word. Yeah, this is the, the plaque. Uh, there's a couple of plaques, one up the hill in the dunes, and uh, this one down on the beach, uh, which was, so it says the hostile Indians had their first encounter here. Kind of a, uh, yeah, that, that was put there in 1920. So that was in 300, uh, the 300th anniversary. And then somewhere around the year 2000, the uh, Wampanoags put in this, this, uh, uh, plaque, which says they were uh, the Nasa tribe of the Wampanoag Nation seeking to protect themselves and their culture mm -hmm. as their first, first encounter. And we call it an inevitable encounter. Now, you probably can't read this, but it, it, you could if you bought the book. But, but anyway, yeah, yeah we call it the inevitable encounter and say, you know, one way to look at it is it's a new world. It's home ownership, cultivate the land, the advancement of Christianity, honor the king, laws, ordinances, constitution, Englishmen. We all call it New England. At the same time, it's an ancient land. It's tribal territory, it's hunting grounds, the great spirit, summer camp, winter camp, sachems, braves, corn, squash, beans, wildfowl. We call it Nauset. So the third paragraph just says, a clash of cultures was inevitable. How the clash would be uh, resolved would determine the success of this attempt of the English to colonize the land called America. Mm -hmm. And we already know it didn't work in, in North Carolina. It didn't work in Jamestown, but it did work here. It lasted for 50 years. So the shallop, yeah, the shallop's reconstruction was amazing. Uh, we were fortunate to get a couple of pieces of the uh, live oak. We have one here on display, actually, at the uh, Fallon Historical Society. We gave one up there to uh, East Ham in a presentation. It's and in Jim Wood, it's in Jim Wood, it's in his office. Office, yeah, yes. um, by the chamber. But this was the um, reunion, bringing the shallop back to Plymouth, and we were down there for, uh, for that occasion as well. And there's some close-ups. This is the Mayflower. It's a great shot with the shallop. The shallop fascinated me because I said it was like the first prefab yeah. uh, piece of uh, uh, information that they were coming back with this, this boat in two sections. The pilgrims would uh, kind of hide in it for some extra protection during the journey. Many of you may have seen this East Ham Bicentennial piece. You'll, you'll see it in the antique shops. Uh, you'll see it in museums as well. Um, and this was kind of the inspiration behind uh, the piece that I did for ACM most recently for their 400th celebration. We, we talked about <clears throat> the purchases of 14 uh, names, 14 families who came to what was then called Nasset. Uh, they had purchased land and they made these purchases from the indigenous people. Um, and then I think in the uh, 1650s, perhaps uh, it became 1654. 1654, yeah. it became uh, Eastham. And so our argument today still is it should be called Nasset. <laughs> uh, praying Indians, there were many praying towns. Uh, and this was one of them. And I'm wondering why the need to feel they had to Christianize the native people, because quite frankly, Kevin, they were already in touch with the earth. They yeah. knew how to sustain their uh, existing existence. And uh, they, uh, you know, I, there, there is a word that they use to uh, define a, a spiritual presence, um, but they, they were already in that frame of mind. Um, but uh, Reverend Treat was speaking their language and he found a way to convince them into their, into our uh, Christianity. And this is the piece that was done for the 400th commemoration. 
the centerpiece of it, the center focus being the shallop. And uh, we show some smoke. Do things they pointed out was they didn't want to show the presence of, of people. And so with a subliminal message, how would you do that? And so I decided to use some smoke coming up out of the dunes. But many of the historical landmarks of East Ham and of course the schoolhouse, the East Ham historical, uh, right down there in the right hand bottom corner. That's right. I, I need to say that. <laughs> and uh, of course, this was the logo that was commissioned. Um, again, it shows uh, the Mayflower flower, the East, the uh, shallop. I said, if you don't incorporate the uh, boat, you're certainly going to miss the boat. Um, and we're going to move her along here because we want to get to the uh, painting. But first, the treaty. So here's the treaty that was made. And, and think about this: it, they landed in on uh, in Plymouth on what the 15th of December, uh, and now it's March 22nd. It's four months later when uh, Massasoit shows up. Obviously, you know the story of Sam and Set and, and Squanto in between to get him there. But the very first day that Massasoit shows up, he and Bradford sit down and, and probably a couple of the other uh, leaders right there as well. And they come up with a treaty that lasts for 50 years. And the treaty is really right out of the Bible all itself. Neither he nor any of his should injure or do any harm to our people. And if any do it to ours, we'll send the offender that he might punish them. As, uh, as Chief uh, Flying Eagle likes to say, it was really, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. We both have to look after each other. Clearly the pilgrims would not have survived if they, they, they support from the, from the natives. And clearly because of the pandemic, the Wampanoag Drive was very, was decimated, 95% gone. Uh, all of Patuxet, all of the Plymouth Plantation was gone. Uh, and, and that's what uh, Squanto came back to. One single Cape Cod town was attacked. So here's, this, here, here's what kind of launches the painting. Uh, and again, this is the word. People who say, well, was there really a first Thanksgiving? Yeah, we believe there was. They might have called it a harvest feast, but certainly it was an integrated with your neighbors, the, the, uh, the Wampanoag were there. And the, the phrase was, our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men uh, out to go hunting, following so that we might after a special manner rejoice together, many of the Indians coming amongst us and amongst the rest, their greatest King Massasoit. There's some 90 men and you'll never see 90 men painted anywhere except this one painting. And for three days, we entertained and feasted. And you know, they say, uh, do they celebrate a Thanksgiving? Well, I know having had conversation with the Wampanoags, that they are thankful every day. And they're a little bit annoyed with us for only celebrating one day out of the month of November. Um, and so maybe we have something to learn right there. But if a picture paints a thousand words, we feel that the first Thanksgiving 1621 painting does that. Uh, it shows clearly the uh, animals uh, fenced in streets. Uh, there's a permanence to the uh, farmland cultivated land, um, and it, it just defines at that time, that moment in our, in our history. And this was the first day of the three-day feast. First day of the three-day feast, exactly. Uh, we highlight here, we show Priscilla Mullins, and she's uh, holding Oceanus in her lap. Uh, Oceanus was born on the voyage coming over, and Peregrine is in the cradle. The cradle is part of the Pilgrim Hall um, archives. Uh, so if you go there, you'll, you'll see that. And, and I have to point out, in case my wife is watching, that, uh, that the fellow there in the gray uh, outfit, well, uh, the tall guy right there by the cradle, that's resolved white. That's mm -hmm. the brother, the older brother of Peregrine. There's, there's an interesting um, 
background to the head table. Uh, we show Governor Bradford there at the head and uh, Brewster is, is standing. And Brewster was a spiritual, spiritual component and advisor in many ways. Um, and they had led a migration. He and Bradford led a migration of Puritans from England to Amsterdam. Um, and so we show Miles Standish, uh, the military leader. He's seated next to John Alden, which is a, another interesting little story. But they all had an incredible uh, background, uh, a lot to contribute. Sam Fuller um, took a crash course in, in medicine so that he could be the, uh, the doctor to the pilgrims. I find that incredible. At the table, we have uh, Squanto, Massasoit, <clears throat> and Habermark. And their relationships between each other is, is fascinating. Um, and I, I have tilted their heads in directions that they're looking. In one case, Squanto and Massasoit, because there was some rivalry sense there that he would have enjoyed being the sachem. Um, but Habermark is uh, opposite Miles Standish. And uh, they had a relationship that he had lived with Miles Standish, the uh, military leader. So it's a, a fascinating uh, dynamic of, of personalities involved all around. Uh, we show the rock 1620. This is a part of the painting, although it's uh, considered myth. The uh, rationalization in incorporating it into the painting was that it did uh, create that determination and resilience of the pilgrims. And so for that reason, the historians allowed the uh, rock to be a part of the painting. <clears throat> in interestingly, the uh, portico was 1920. Once again, it was uh, the 300th anniversary. So you have the portico, you have Massasoit State. And, and by the way, some people kind of twist the word Massasoit, and maybe some people in the audience we, we do it, we say Massasoit because that's how uh, Bradford wrote it. He, he wrote it with a Y, which would indicate that that was probably how he pronounced it as well. So in 1920, there's Massasoit, there's Governor Bradford's statue, uh, and, and that was all for the, for the uh, 300th anniversary. One of the things that Karen likes to point out you know, this this year for the 400th, much of it was academic and research oriented, but then you like to talk about the pandemic too. Well, I, I, coincidence <laughs> or, or not, but, yeah. um, you know, it's an amazing clash of uh, coincidence that the pandemic and our um, epidemic here, the pandemic here, their epidemic and our pandemic was so integrated almost to the exact timing. Um, but uh, I wanted to also talk about, and, and that's another whole subject that doesn't, uh, have, we don't have time for it uh, right now. Um, but I wanted to talk about the iconicness uh, aspect of the rock. You know, they say, how did the rock become so famous and Plymouth get so much credit and, and the Pilgrims as well? It's like all of the ideals of the pilgrims, the family, protection of their families, um, being able to survive in a, in a harmonious uh, scenario. Those are the things that, that we so, still search for today. They're still the things we fight for today. And clearly we show here two cultures coming together. We're very uh, happy to convey that feeling at that time uh, because there are, I think, more uh, less the differences and more the common commonalities between cultures. And again, that is something that is, is being uh, very pronounced in today's uh, uh, world. This is the legend that identifies all of the people in, in the background. It's uh, informative, it's educational, it's uh, conversation provoking as well. And uh, we hope that you've enjoyed our information. We feel that it's, um, uh, something that needs to be uh, shared and told and, and brought back into the schools as well. This is our book. It's available at about six museums on the Cape from Provincetown to uh, Plymouth. 
and several of the bookstores, uh, including, uh, well, we have it up in the East Ham at the National Seashore. So uh, please check it out. And um, Kevin and I, thank you for your time. Hope you've enjoyed. And, and it also invites you to Falmouth to see this firsthand at the yeah. museums on the green. And Eileen, if you would like, if you want to have a Q&A, we'll be glad to do our best at this time too. Yes, we'd like to take this opportunity to open up if anyone has questions for either Karen or Kevin, um, please feel free to signal us and they will take your questions. Uh, that doesn't appear to be. Are we frozen? I'm going to say that no one has any questions. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank Karen and Kevin. It's been very informative. And I particularly like the, um, the way you have outlined this painting and shown the various characters that participated at that first Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, there was a I'm going to take a good look at that myself. There's a 14 minute video that documents every single stroke in the painting. And that's something that can be made available as well. Okay. And yeah. once again, I invite you all to stop by the 1869 Schoolhouse Museum tomorrow at noon. And there will be a book signing there by Karen. Um, and you're all welcome to join us. Thank you, very thank much. you for coming. Thank you all. And thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody.